I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining our program, The Truth About America's Deep State, and that's the name of the program, and it's with David Rode. My name is Marcos Kunalakis, and I am uh, the uh, I'm a visiting fellow at the uh, Hoover Institution and also the foreign affairs columnist for the McClatchy chain of newspapers. The program today is brought to you by uh, World Affairs and the Pacific Council on International Policy. World Affairs' mission is to convene thought leaders, change makers, and engage citizens to share ideas, learn from each other, and affect change. Solutions to the world's most challenging problems are found when the private, philanthropic, and public sectors work together. So today with us is David Rode, and David is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist and also the executive editor of the New Yorker.com, uh, which many of you often dip into, uh, especially since some of the content is available and some of you may even be subscribers to the New Yorker. Uh, okay. But David has just written a book and it is called In Deep. Uh, I won't go through the full subtext and uh, subtitle of the book because we'll be talking about that specifically, but it is in effect about the deep state. And David, thank you for joining us today. Why don't we start out by talking about this concept? Let's define the term of the deep state and what it is. So I actually uh, uh, don't like the term uh, the deep state. I, I think it's political rhetoric. Um, uh, the, the, the president, I mean, it's been used by various folks, but it's used by the president. It's a very conspiratorial sounding term. Um, and, and part of the book's effort is to try to talk about what's more, I think a better term is the permanent government or the institutional government. There are about 3 million Americans who work for the federal government. They range from, you know, CIA covert operatives and, and FBI agents to, you know, uh, employees of the Department of Education, uh, you know, or uh, Homeland Security people you know, screening folks in the, in the airport. Right, and you talk about this a fair amount in the book in trying to define it because others like Steve Bannon refer to it as the administrative state. And, and you, and, but it's not just a term of those on the right who are opposed to or fear, are fearful of or identify a deep state, one that is an unelected sort of permanent bureaucratic system of operating. It's also uh, those on the left. And they say, as you write in the book, that there is something like the military industrial complex that runs things. Could you sort of run the spectrum of that uh, understanding? Yeah, look, so there is fear of government, fear of the federal government um, on both the right and the left. Um, as you said, the liberals, you know, talk about the military industrial complex. That would be a cabal of generals um, and uh, defense contractors who are seen, you know, it's feared are driving the country into repeated wars. Uh, on the right, it would be the administrative state. And that would be what you, you mentioned. It was a, there was a piece that uh, appeared in Breitbart when Steve Bannon was running it, that uh, after Trump had won the election, it was late November 2016, you know, said that a great struggle had now begun between Donald Trump and the administrative state. Uh, in that piece, um, it was a very broad definition of the administrative state. It was essentially anyone who works for government uh, local governments too. So, you know, your local police officer or school teacher, um, anyone who has contracts with the government, uh, any sort of members of, you know, the Washington kind of elite, uh, the press would be part of the administrative state. So, but the fear from conservatives is an ever growing state that's kind of uh, invading their lives and taking away their, their personal rights. Um, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a very strong current and, and many, many conservatives are, are worried about that. But it's gone beyond that, right? Since the Trump administration came into office, it, it has grown to mean, I think, and as we observe the actions of the administration, anyone who doesn't support this administration or this president is a part of this conspiratorial deep state from their perspective. Yes, and, and it's, the rhetoric's grown more heated like it has in general in our, in our politics. But, and first to be fair, every president um, often or every modern president <clears throat> has complained about, you know, government bureaucracy and, and wanting their uh, agenda enacted, but the, the government not moving quickly enough. So when Ronald Reagan came into office, you know, he was frustrated with the State Department. He said it was filled with liberals and they weren't carrying out his agenda to stop communism aggressively enough. Barack Obama felt that he was being uh, cornered by uh, leaks from Pentagon generals who wanted 
a large troop increase in Afghanistan and the leaks of these numbers, you know, would box in Obama in terms of the number of troops he sent. But, but what is different is the, is the tone and the rhetoric. And over time, you know, uh, Trump's use of the term kind of deep state started out with the FBI. Uh, he was very angry about the FBI's Trump Russia investigation. We can talk about that in more detail. Um, it's expanded, though. He went after uh, parts of the CIA when they had assessments that um, he didn't like. Um, there was recently an issue where he was defending a, a special forces soldier who was accused of war crimes, and then he called the Pentagon, um, you know, itself uh, the deep state. And now, um, I think Trump hasn't used the term, but in, as the coronavirus, um, you know, challenge has emerged and the country's been shut down, uh, some of his supporters have called Dr. Anthony Fauci the well-known, you know, every day on the press conferences, infectious disease expert. There's been allegations that Fauci is part of the deep state and that Fauci exaggerated the need for people to shelter in place as a way to slow down the economy and hurt President Trump's reelection chances. So is this rhetoric and this identification of this existent uh, group of experts and permanent government employees is the is the attempt whether it's this administration or previous administrations to try and uh, consolidate power within the executive branch or within the presidency so that they can be much more effective in what it is they want to pursue their policies or is it just a sort of a natural tension that would exist in a system of checks and balances where you've really uh, systemically planned to redistribute this type of power, whether it be to Congress or to a permanent bureaucracy. So I guess I'm asking, is it is it something that's a systemic issue or is it something that's unique to the presidency itself that always will pit them against every other uh, source of power within uh, within government? I think it's, um, I think this dynamic has happened for a long time. I mean, when you talk to the two sides, they have completely different perspectives. Um, there, there was a, there's a, um, a Democratic senator who I talked to who you know, talks a lot to his Republican colleagues. And th there is a sort of ideological uh, difference. Um, you know, since the 80s, uh, for conservatives, they've really you know, lionized the public sector. And this Democratic senator told me he estimated about 40% of uh, his Republican colleagues, about 40% of Republican senators. Um, it's not that they see that, you know, they, they, I should say the administrative state, and I want to stay away from the deep state term. Sure they all believe in, in sort of an administrative state. They think that um, anybody who wants to work in government must sort of lean left. Um, if you're, you know, if you really want to excel, you know, you would much rather be in the private sector is the view. And they are very suspicious of these government workers and they feel that they could be thwarting cons the conservative agenda just because they, they tend to lean left. And I, um, I don't think that's, you know, I looked at that extensively and, and then, uh, but when I talked to, to career civil servants, they said that there aren't uh, such efforts. They said that they do uh, abide by very strict laws. Uh, the Hatch Act was passed um, after, um, during the 1940s, there was actually a use of federal government employees to, um, on a political campaign. And the Hatch Act bars federal government employees from engaging in political activities. Uh, Joan Dempsey, who is a, um, a career, she's retired now, but she was one of the main characters in the book. She, you know, defended the civil service. She rose to be the number three official at the CIA. And she said they are an asset for the country. They do carry out the orders of new presidents as long as they're, you know, le legal. And that, you know, he, she called uh, career civil servants competent uh, do-gooders. Um, but there's, there's clearly a gulf. Uh, we do need them as one of the conclusions of the book. You know, you have to have some sort of some permanent government agencies, coronavirus shows us that. You need a center for disease control for situations like this. Right, and we'll talk about that a bit later when we look at sort of the domestic issues of what the administrative state uh, does, the competence that it has and the expertise that it exhibits. But um, let's talk, since we have, this is World Affairs and the Pacific Council, let's uh, look at foreign policy a little bit, because it seems that if there's one area in which the executive, the president, has really, if not exclusive, then certainly uh, a power that supersedes those of the other branches, it is in foreign policy. 
And so, um, for example, we know that um, when it comes to engaging with other countries, he has almost an exclusive, and I, it is he still, we still have only had men presidents. Uh, he has this uh, exclusive, really, uh, ability to call for summits, to engage other nations in a, in a really, uh, how does the deep state then engage when it comes to foreign policies. Uh, David, I'm gonna just uh, mention one more thing. We know that uh, the one area that Congress uh, can affect foreign policy is in declaring war, uh, but they haven't done that since World War II. We've been through Korea, Vietnam, and Iraq without the engagement of Congress. So the president has really this exclusive field. Congress can play a limited role and the deep state or the administrative state exists to some degree. How do those, how, what, how does that interaction occur? Well, the, the tension would be, you know, at the State Department and, and to a lesser extent, theoretically, on the National Security Council. Um, look, uh, one very specific example from the book is that I talked to an administration official who wanted, uh, who said that um, President Trump, this person's now a former uh, official, um, wanted to pull all US troops out of Syria. And he brought up this idea repeatedly um, when he first got into office. And, you know, um, State Department people and, and the military officials would sort of try to talk him out of it and say why this was a bad idea for American interests. And Trump grew more and more frustrated. And, and again, to be fair to him, an election is held. You know, every four years a president is elected. They run on a platform and, you know, the president has a democratic mandate to carry out their policies. And, and these government officials, you know, as in a democracy should do what, what he is saying. Um, Trump got so frustrated uh, thinking that his orders weren't being carried out that he would start to tweet them in some ways um, to, to get them done. So even in foreign policy, which is, you're right, under the Constitution, very much the president's purview, there's a sense of frustration, at least from this president, about getting his foreign policy carried out. Right. And we saw just specifically about Syria, probably the loss of two of the more high profile members of his administration. General Jim Mattis shortly left after the Syria announcement via tweet and the ability for and the inability for him to convince the president otherwise. And also Ambassador Brett McGurk, who was in uh, northeast Syria and running what was, uh, by all accounts, a fairly inexpensive, uh, relatively safe um, peacekeeping mission, to put it uh, in, in simple terms, of 2,000 American troops uh, who were stationed there and were really in very little danger, but were able to keep the parties apart and maintain security for the Kurds. So is that the only recourse then that those in the administrative part of the state have, is really leaving an administration that they disagree with? Or are there opportunities, as were implied by Anonymous, the famous uh, op-ed writer who uh, entered the pages of the New York Times, are there opportunities to actually undermine the president in a very effective way? I, I would disagree with Anonymous. I, I, I think it's not proper for a non-elected official to, um, and I, we should talk about what undermine uh, means. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, Look, the term whistleblower is a positive one. It's someone who's, who's pointing out possibly illegal activity. You know, that, that was the argument for the whistleblower in the, in the Ukraine uh, case. Um, but sort of, you know, thwarting the president's agenda in secret when you're not an elected official troubles me. Um, I, I think that creates all kinds of problems. I mentioned that's why I kind of used the Reagan and Obama example. You know, it's liberals would not be pleased if generals were thwarting Barack Obama's goals and conservatives would not, you know, be thrilled if State Department officials were, were blocking, you know, Ronald Reagan. So it, I don't want to go down that road. I think there should be healthy debates and, and people should raise their voices um, in, inside the White House. I think um, I'm biased, but leaking to the press, if you feel a, a policy is, is not, you know, is crazy or not in the interest of the country, I think that's fine too. That's part of a democratic debate, but outright, you know, subverting a president's, uh, you know, explicit stated and legal policy. I, I think that's, that's going um, too far. 
Right, and so what you see instead, and I think that the majority of those who are within the state, working in the state, probably feel the same way, understanding their constitutional obligations and the privileges of a presidency. But there are other ways, of course, to undermine, if not undermine directly the policy, then certainly to uh, approach with go slow types of actions. I recall there was a call for, uh, by the president, for a military parade that never really appeared uh, on the streets of Washington, D.C. Uh, this is not unique in the United States. It's also true in other countries where the administrative state is able to define sort of the pace at which government works. They are, but I, I would argue, um, going back to the Reagan administration, um, one of Ed Meese's first jobs before he became uh, attorney general was that they set up a very aggressive hiring process in the Reagan administration, and they were able to bring in all these committed conservatives. One unusual thing about the American system is that, you know, an American president appoints 3,000 political appointees across the top of the government to run all these agencies. Uh, and the Reagan administration was very good at, at doing that, and then it carried out its policies. There were famous skirmishes with the EPA. Uh, there was issues um, also with the Justice Department when, when Meese took over there. So I would argue that it's the responsibility of the president to, to get in there and get his, you know, his, it is all, they're all men, uh, get their, you know, their people into these uh, agencies. Um, and again, if it's not uh, illegal, you know, it's, 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 it should be carried out. Just a, a separate thing, there is a view of people in the government, particularly in the CIA and the FBI, if you've noticed that Gina Haspel, um, very rarely the head of the CIA speaks in public, um, Chris Ray, the head of the FBI, uh, is very rare as well. They're, they're holding less, testifying less before Congress because every time they speak publicly, they're asked questions uh, by senators or representatives that will kind of show daylight between their expert opinion and what President Trump thinks. And there is a mindset, um, I, I did not interview either official for the book, they would not speak to me, that, you, that it's better to stay out of the spotlight, stay out of the president's crosshairs, that kind of waiting out the administration, particularly at this point close to an election, is, is the best thing to do for one's uh, institution. Um, the flip side of that is that we're going to an election and um, the country's top military intelligence officials are essentially not weighing in on the public debate. Um, and, you know, that's, a, that's concerning. Right. Well, a lot of your book actually does look at these two organizations, the FBI and the CIA and the role that they've played. And, and it's a role that has been suspect, as you say, uh, for many, many years, uh, going back to Nixon. And of course, uh, even more recently, when we had revelations from WikiLeaks and from others who uh, have revealed actions that, are, uh, that were taken by these uh, institutions that... Uh, well, were questionable in some instances, but in others really did infringe upon the civil rights of Americans. So it's been fairly easy to raise the specter uh, that these institutions are out of control, are operating independent and without the type of accountability that uh, one would expect in a constitutional democracy. Could you expand a bit more about that tension between the current administration or any administration and CIA, FBI? So the book starts with the history of a bunch of reforms that were made in the 1970s. And that's supposed to be sort of a line in terms of misconduct by the CIA and the FBI. Um, there was a congressional committee, a Senate committee, the, the church committee that revealed, you know, astonishing abuses. The CIA was, you know, uh, surveilling um, Americans inside this country. Uh, you know, they followed John Lennon when he was protesting the Vietnam War. They were opening uh, people's mail. Uh, the FBI famously harassed and wiretapped Martin Luther King to try to discredit him. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover had a list of uh, roughly 20,000, uh, I think, Americans he was going to round up in, in case of emergency. Norman Mailer was on that list. Um, after this was all aired, you know, there was a strong feeling in the late 70s to have more control. So there was the new intelligence committees created in Congress. Uh, it had, they have subpoena powers. That doesn't exist, let's say, in the British government, you know, or the French government. Um, and, you know, a new federal court was created that had to approve all wiretaps to stop FBI wiretapping abuses. Inspectors general were created. That's come up again in terms of coronavirus, trying to have inspectors general to look at that money. 
Um, and then special prosecutors uh, like Robert Mueller, that, that came out of this same era. Um, and that was also to act as sort of a check, a check on the president. The CIA and FBI transgressions since then have largely been, and I'm, I'm sure someone is going to catch me here, um, the CIA and the FBI following the orders of the president. Uh, post 9 11, uh, warrantless mass surveillance, where the Bush administration decided the president had the power to carry out surveillance and it, they did not need to go to this federal court that had been created to get warrants uh, approved by a judge. Uh, rendition, torture, establishing Guantanamo, again, orders by the president that the president said, you know, were legal, particularly the, the torture debate. This was not the CIA going and doing things in secret without a president knowing. Um, you know, the Snowden revelations, the eavesdropping there, uh, Obama had gone to this federal court, it's called the, the FISA court, and gotten, you know, uh, federal court approval for all that eavesdropping. Americans were shocked to hear it. Um, so that doesn't justify it. I think there's a lot of problems with the, the surveillance court I've been mentioning. We can talk about that separately. But I do think the system after that was created after the church committee, I call it the, you know, post-church reform norms, um, has largely held based on what I've heard. Right, and, and part of the church committee's findings were also uh, revealing that there were things like political assassinations in other countries. I think that was highly troubling to Americans to find out that in fact this type of activity is occurring. And by all accounts, uh, depending on how you interpret the Soleimani uh, attack, uh, but by all accounts, it seems as if uh, that order has been held. Uh, again, I guess there's one more of Al Alauki, who was also a U.S. citizen uh, overseas, who was struck by a drone. But I, I think that's one of the reforms. I, I think another reform, David, and this one probably speaks to you personally, was that journalists were no longer allowed to be used as intelligence agencies. And I yeah. mentioned that in your context, of course, because you were, I think, when detained and kidnapped, accused of being an agent of the American government. Yeah, I was. I was. Um... Actually, I was jailed twice. Early in my career, I was held for about 10 days in Bosnia, uh, and uh, Bosnian Serbs um, believed that I was, um, you know, a spy, NATO spy. Uh, I was actually looking for mass graves for mass executions that had been carried out around the town of Srebrenica. Yeah, and then uh, 12 or so uh, years later, I was kidnapped by the Taliban. They also thought I was a spy, um, and the U.S. government was, you know, secretly had staged 9-11 to spread Christianity in, in Muslim countries that they could could invade. So, yeah, it's and as far as I know, you know the, that uh, the assassination ban, um, you know, has been withheld, and that it was the order of President Trump that led to Soleimani's death. Yes, it was an order of, you know, President Obama's that led to Al Laki uh, being killed. But the slippage post 9/11 is that you know the, we use drone strikes. Uh, they are essentially assassinations, and um, you know, they're, they were justified by President Obama as, 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 you know, a way needed to counter terrorism. So, but what's disturbing about al is that an American citizen was killed without any public presentation of the evidence against him, no court proceeding whatsoever. And that, that's, you know, troubling that, that the U.S. government can kill an American citizen without any sort of court proceeding, the executive branch, I should say, you know, that, that's troubling as well. And so there's a sense that Many of these powers that the presidency lost uh, after Watergate were restored, particularly in foreign policy and national security after 9-11. David, you mentioned earlier uh, the Russia investigation and that led uh, in part, I guess, or at least prepared the ground for the impeachment as well. Could you tell us how you believe the Trump administration has used those two data points to reinforce their argument? So I, I think the president is sort of an extraordinary communicator and, and messenger, and anyone who questions his mental stability or, or thinks he doesn't know what he's doing is is, is underestimating um, President Trump. Um, he's been very effective using you know the term witch hunt to say that the Trump Russia investigation was unjustified and uh, completely illegal. Um, I looked at this a lot as part of the book, uh, and, and I'll just say uh, as a journalist in the summer of 2016. Uh, I had the famous dossier. Almost every uh, major news organization had it. Um, a, a colleague of mine, I was at Reuters at the time, had gotten uh, Christopher Steele's dossier from uh, Fusion GPS, the opposition research firm, Glenn Simpson, 
had given it to, to him and I spoke to Glenn Simpson myself. And in it, it said that Carter Page, um, a Trump advisor, was meeting with Russian officials in Moscow. I spent, you know, large parts of the summer, dozens of journalists did as well, trying to get the FBI to talk about these contacts between, you know, Trump aides and Russians. Uh, I specifically asked a senior Justice Department official who would know, and the person declined to comment on me, um, sorry, to me. And then uh, about six weeks before the election, I had an interview with John Brennan. He was then the CIA director. And I remember sitting in his office in Langley, Virginia, in the FBI, I'm sorry, in the CIA headquarters. And you look out the window and there's this beautiful sort of canopy of green verdant trees. And then I sort of awkwardly asked Brennan, is it true that Russia has incriminating videotapes about you know, the Republican nominee, Donald Trump? And, and Brennan was sort of very quiet and sort of seemed somewhat surprised. And then he just said, I'm, I'm not engaging on this question. I'm not, I'm not confirming what you're saying. I'm not denying what you're saying. And, and then he was very emphatic. You know, he said, David, you're going to hear a lot of crazy things in the last six weeks or so of this election. A lot of crazy things about, you know, Donald Trump, a lot of crazy things about Hillary Clinton. And he urged me not to report things I couldn't thoroughly confirm. And, you know, fast forward to today, there's, there's, you know, reports or claims that Brennan was secretly spreading the dossier. In my case, he didn't. Uh, I, I've, I've had some people say, you know, uh, Brennan was just lying to you, you're, you're a fool. But I, you know, at least, and then the last thing is, uh, Reuters, my news organization then, many, and, and the overwhelming majority of news organizations never wrote about the dossier during the election. Uh, the FBI never leaked the fact that they had launched a criminal investigation into Trump and ties with Russia. If they wanted to damage him during the campaign and block him from being elected, you know, the FBI could have done that. So those are just a couple data points of my own personal experience about, um, I, I think that, and we've talked about this, there's problems with how Carter Page was later surveilled, but uh, that this was a coup that the FBI and CIA, you know, tried to prevent him from being elected is an exaggeration and the, the president often exaggerates and, and this is one of them. Right, well, we have a number of people who are listening and maybe that'll be one of the questions that comes up. So I'd like to open it up to questions. And if you have a question as you're listening uh, and wanna join us by, and, and if you're on the phone, you can uh, simply dial star nine and that will get you through and it'll put you in the queue for questions. Uh, and if you've joined via the Zoom app uh, on your computer, then uh, look at the bottom of the screen here and um, you can uh, click the raise hand icon. There's a little uh, icon down there that'll say raise hand and I'll look for it. Um, and then we'll begin uh, the Q&A in, in just a few minutes. So David, before we go to uh, some of the questions, let's really talk about the issue of the day, uh, the reason that you and I are both home and why our viewers are also at home, which is of course, of course the COVID crisis. And in, in the context of your book where expertise is being questioned, where uh, professionals' motivations are being questioned, and also, at a time when uh, it really seems the most opportune moment for an executive, a president, to consolidate power uh, in his office. How should we look at what's occurring now and, and then look at the administrative state and its role and it, the assault upon the administrative state and how it's manifested itself in this COVID crisis? So I, I think, you know, the crisis shows that there is a need for expertise. There's a need for, you know, a federal government that's not huge and bloated, you know, but that that's effective and that can deal with, with a crisis uh, like this. Um, what's con concerning, you know, there, there have been news reports that the president didn't take the early warnings about coronavirus seriously. Um, you know, there, there'll have to be more reporting on that. I, I can't say that firsthand it costs any lives or anything like that. But just the firing um, yesterday um, of uh, Rick Bright, he's a leading um, infectious disease expert, um, uh, was really troubling. Uh, Bright issued a statement that uh, he was opposed to the use of chloroquine, I might be mispronouncing it, but the anti-malarial drug, um, that he wanted rigorous testing of that drug before it was made available to people. The president's been pushing that drug and he was removed. And when a president, I'm sorry, when a reporter asked the president about it at the press conference yesterday, the president sort of dismissed the reporter's question and, and how do you know he's an expert 
and that that kind of dismissal, the the, the idea, the, the pattern of kind of instantly discrediting, uh, you know, experts whose opinions disagree with him is really troubling. This happened to Dan Coates, just to go back to foreign policy, the director of national intelligence. He said that the assessment of the intelligence community experts was that Kim Jong-un would not give up his nuclear weapons. Uh, when he said that in public at a hearing, you know, the president attacked him. So, you know, I don't trust all intelligence officials. We, the FBI and the CIA are very powerful and dangerous. They need aggressive oversight by elected officials and the courts and the press. Um, but when we can't agree on basic facts, you know, the coronavirus shows us when we can't agree on whether we need to stay at home to help each other, you know, we can't, I think, function as a sort of healthy society and democracy. There has to be some basic agreement on, on facts so we can and help each other. Great, David, uh, thank you. We're opening it up for questions. Again, those who wanna call in, if you're on a phone, uh, uh, dial star nine, and those of you who are on this Zoom call can just go to the bottom and find the icon that says raise hand. Here we go, we have somebody named Dr. Who, who is on uh, Zoom, who we're going to go to. Can you hear me now? Yes, Dr. Who. Here we go. I'm wondering how much influence does the C CNP, the Council, Council of National Policy, has uh, on uh, or have on Trump's decision in his thinking or other issues. There are quite a few uh, that are members. Pat, a good example of Pat, president of the organization, Pat Robinson, Jay Sekulow is on it, uh, Conway, not the husband, obviously, <laughs> Bannon, just to name a few. I noticed that when he got in, uh, that a lot of these people are in his administration. What do these people or, or the CNP have any decisions in his thinking? I'm just wondering, I, is, am I right or wrong? Or is there a, uh, you know, the group uh, telling them what to do? Uh, you know, that's a question I have. All right, Dr. Who, um, so the CNP, are we, are we talking about the Center for National Policy or is there some other yeah, CNP? Yeah. Well, they're, they're a think tank or stink tank. I guess you could think it out. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're I guess I should admit that I was once a board member of the CNP, the Center for National Policy, uh, back when Tim Romer was uh, the uh, chair, the executive director, and uh, former directors of the CNP included Leon Panetta and uh, Madeleine Albright. So uh, is there some level of conspiracy, perhaps, that's going on there, or is it just an affinity between like-minded leaders who uh, then find their way into government? Um, there are... Uh... There's various conservative think tanks that have, you know, played a central role in the Trump administration. The Heritage Foundation has come up with a lot of the uh, conservative proposals sort of about deregulation and about the environment. The Federalist Society has played a central role in the, in the appointment of conservative judges. Um, and I, there's another, there's a, I think there's another organization with the same CNP um, initials that, that is more conservative um, that Dr. Hu is referring to. Um, and the Trump won, and you know many Republicans who'd kept their distance from him took positions in the administration. Um, I spoke to one official um, who was a, is a very committed uh, religious uh, conservative, and you know asked them about you know are they uncomfortable with Trump? Some people you know question his personal background and um, ethics and the way he sort of attacks people. And this person said, no, they had no issue at all working with Trump because he is delivering on the conservative agenda. Um, and this person also felt that there is a, a, an organized effort by liberals to, to take away people's religious freedoms that uh, people who are religious in the United States are, are, are you know, mocked and uh, discriminated against. So um, he has very strong support from conservatives. They have become more and more, uh, you know, Washington conservatives uh, and he's happily carrying out many of the policies that they that they support. So, again, I would I'm not a big believer in conspiracy theories. So, that's you know a new president wins an election, and you know think tanks in Washington that are conservative work with him. Um, and I, I think that's as long as it's not illegal, you know that's partly how the system works. Right. Uh, so um, I will remind everyone that um, we have uh, our lines open. In fact, some of the uh, questions are coming in over uh, a special little screen here that says Q&A. And I have a question here from Tahir. 
And the question is, it seems like disemboweling the State Department is part of the Republican agenda. Uh, you mentioned earlier how uh, President referred to the Deep State Department uh, when, when in front of Dr. Fauci. Uh, and then Tahir goes on to say, I recall it being a complaint about George W. Bush as well as Trump. Why is this? So I think Republicans, and I mentioned Reagan earlier, um, see the State Department as you know, extremely liberal. I think the EPA as well. And um, they, they fear that, that the, the State Department officials aren't carrying out um, you know, George W. Bush's you know, uh, agenda in terms of counterterrorism and now, and now with Trump. And, and then there's this sort of, again, this Republican sense of a bloated government that you don't need such a big State Department. Um, and, and I think that it's easy to switch to the coronavirus as a topic as an argument for why you need uh, some of these government agencies. So, uh, but there is your right to hear that there's a long history of suspicion of the State Department. I thought it was interesting uh, during the um, impeachment thing, having uh, career foreign diplomats uh, testify. Uh, Ambassador, you know, Masha Yovanovitch, Fiona Hill, who was a national security uh, advisor uh, or staffer and, and an expert on, on Russia. Um, and other career diplomats testifying, uh, they all, you know, stuck very closely to being neutral and being uh, nonpartisan. And I think that was a helpful thing. And, and that's, I think it's important for civil servants and even for journalists, very much so to kind of, you know, not be overly partisan. Commentators can be, we have plenty of that clearly in our society. But I thought what struck me about the, their testimony was that it was a chance for Americans to sort of meet the deep state meet these people in the State Department, you know, who conservatives fear are undermining the president and, and judge for themselves based on how they responded to questions. Are these committed public servants or are they biased members of the, of the deep state? Right. We have another question here from Becky, uh, who is in Indian Wells, California. And she asks, what's your view of James Comey and his actions in dealing with the president when he was the FBI director? Um, so one of the main uh, characters in the book is Jim Baker. Uh, he was the general counsel of the FBI through the summer of 2016 and through the fall of 2017. Uh, I did not speak to Comey uh, for the book. Uh, Baker defended all of their actions. He said that um, they felt they had no choice but to launch a criminal investigation of the Trump campaign uh, after they, and many of you know, you've heard this, but it, that you know, they received information from that George Papadopoulos had told a foreign diplomat that the Russians were trying to make contact with the campaign and that they had incriminating information about uh, Hillary Clinton. The Russians already hacked the emails. The president had publicly, now president, but then candidate Trump had called for the Russians to do that. So um, I sort of agree with the inspector general, Michael Horowitz, finding that the opening of the FBI Trump Russia investigation was proper. Um, a lot of people, though, just so you know, in the FBI liked uh, Comey, but they've been really frustrated with him being very partisan um, after he left as FBI director, him calling on Americans to not vote for Trump. And there's a frustration I heard from FBI agents who, who say, we are apolitical, we want to go kick down doors and, and arrest bad guys. But when Comey is overtly political, it undermines this view of the FBI, it plays in to the, you know, conspiracy theory that the FBI is sort of secretly and actively, you know, plotting against uh, different presidents. Uh, David, let me go to our last question here and then uh, we'll let you go. Um, this is from Robert, who's at the Harvard Kennedy School, and he asks, when have the White House and Deep State been most in lockstep? And what have been the positive or negative outcomes of that type of unity? That's a great question. Uh, that's why he's at the Kennedy School. <laughs> um, look, I, I could, you could, I would, I think that, you know, the government overall, um, in the initial days after 9-11, you know, I think um, functioned well. I, I don't want to get into, you know, rendition and torture and mass surveillance. I think those are, those were questionable activities that weren't authorized by judges or, or Congress and you know, and I think we're, we're problematic, but I, there are moments in national crisis when the government, you know, does respond well. We don't know yet how well the federal government is, is responding in the coronavirus. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's clearly in terms of ventilators, um, the federal government and the states have responded well. I, I believe 
Governor Cuomo of New York when he says no one has, you know, died after being denied a ventilator. That That's, you know, an effective uh, teamwork going on. Testing, I think, the, the, the verdict's still out. So I think there's times when, you know, state governments or the federal government, when the workforce works very, very well with elected official, and that's how government, you know, should work, and it, and it can work. Um, and, and when there's that deep suspicion uh, from both sides, when I think government workers feel and, you know, that they're being sort of used as political pawns as uh, when they are less effective and would slow roll policies. Um, but I think people come together uh, during crises. Uh, and I, I, I just thank everybody for, for attending this. Or let me, let me slow down here and send it back to you, Marcos. But that was a, that's a great question. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Robert, for asking the question, you know, and, and as I said, we should have made that's the last question that we'll do today. David, it's really been great. I, I had an opportunity to uh, be with you uh, earlier last week when we discussed this. And I think that uh, is available on iTunes, on Apple iTunes at World Affairs. So you can listen to our conversation. And there was a follow up conversation with Julian Tett at the FT. Uh, where we talked about the current crisis and, and tried to contextualize it as well within these larger questions of, of governance. Um, but David, uh, thank you for writing a book that is going to uh, really have a focus on these questions because they are unanswered questions. It seems that there is an ongoing dynamic. Uh, it seems that parts of what you've identified are inherent in our democratic system, but our others seem to be extraordinarily tested at this moment. Um, and of course, thank you for the work that you do at the newyorker.com. Make sure those of you who are watching or listening that you go to newyorker.com and, and read some of David's uh, fantastic editing and occasional writing. And um, uh, anything you'd like to leave us with as you, uh, as you leave us? Just the last thing is a, a plea for folks to be, uh, be skeptical of government workers, be skeptical of the FBI and CIA, uh, but be, don't be cynical. I, I do think most government workers, most people, everybody, it's easy to hold up Tony Fauci, are, are doing their level best to try to give good information. And I, I think it's just important. There's so much division and discord and, and conspiracy theory circulating right now. Um, you know, try not to think the worst of, of each other. Great closing, great closing words, David. And to you and to everyone who's on this call, be well, stay safe, and beat the bug. Thank you. Thank you.